Benjamin Franklin grew up in a home with a whole ton of kids. And when he was in his early teens, it was time for him to go off an apprentice and learn a trade so that he could provide for himself. Because back then, that's what kids did, is they helped provide for the family as quick as possible. So his dad tried him at candle making. He absolutely hated candle making. I can imagine for a mind as active as his, the monotony of it was just unbelievably difficult to handle. And so he apprenticed him under his brother in um, the publishing trade. Well, his brother was a taskmaster, sometimes abusive, hit him, railed on him, and you know, this is, you know, the famous years, the silence do good letters, and he wrote and he published and he realized he, he was pretty good at that. He read on his own as much as he could and um, wanted to educate himself and rise, was an ambitious person, but this was not working being with his brother. And so he ran away and he fell into the company of not great people. He wound up going over to England in the, under the auspices of getting some stuff over there to come in and go into publishing. And I think it was the governor or the mayor, somebody of the town he was in, was supposed to write a letter and he got all the way to England and found out that the letter wasn't there and that this guy was just a bit of a scoundrel and he wasn't gonna have any financial help so he had to get work and he was with a friend and this friend was a bad influence and so anyway, he was over in England for a while and then he came back and he ended up set, um, settling in Philadelphia and now he was a little older, he was a little wiser. Uh, he was in his 20s, he'd made some stupid decisions that had been very costly morally, financially, and he wanted to be a better man. He wanted to educate himself because he didn't have access to expensive formal education. And so he decided to form a book club. He called it the Junto or the Junto. I still have not been able to get clear on how you pronounce it. He called it a club for mutual improvement, which I love so much better than calling it a book club. And he said that they drew up rules so that it would be genuinely beneficial to everybody. And he said they had rules that everybody had to follow in order that they would prevent our disgusting each other. So he didn't want them to, you know, have our, you know, really heated arguments for people to go away upset for it to ruin relationships or to just have bad manners or whatever the case was. So the rules were that they would come up with questions and readings and they would read and I think they met every week, at least every other week. And they wanted to talk about the, the topics of morals, politics and natural philosophy, which is kind of the sciences. So it's a very broad, broad education and they were going to try to read some of the best books they could get their hands on. They each had a few copies, but of course there, weren't, there wasn't a lot of bookmaking in America. Most of the books still came from England. They were very, very expensive. They had to cross the ocean. And so they were borrowing each other's books and trying to get their hands on whatever they could to read and discuss. And then he wanted them to improve their thinking skills through writing, because thinking and writing are very closely attached. And so every quarter they were supposed to write an essay and present it to everybody and then everybody would give their, their feedback. But he said that the main objective here, this was a club for mutual improvement, which was to be conducted in the sincere spirit of inquiry after truth without fondness for dispute or desire of victory. And so it really wasn't about, are you smarter? I, am I smarter? You know, there was a tradition back in the Greek world that public speaking became very popular. It was actually lucrative. People could make a living at it. And the sophists came in and the sophist tradition was debating simply to win. It was learning a skill set to undercut the other person's argument and to build arguments in such a way that they would seem logically flawless and you would win a debate. 
but they weren't inquiries after truth and they were fascinating and entertaining, but they didn't enrich the speakers or the public in the sense that they didn't elevate them. It, the, it didn't bring them to truth. And it would, this was very distasteful to the philosophers like Plato and Aristotle and others. And some of the Greek plays make fun of some of the sophists because of this tradition of sophistry. And that's why it's called sophistry because it's surface level, something that sophistry is meant to deceive or to trick or to be a surface level activity. And Benjamin Franklin didn't want that. He wanted a sincere inquiry after truth. And he wrote about this in his autobiography. And this is where he also writes about his 13 values when he made this practice of trying to become a better man by writing down uh, uh, virtues, the, the virtues that he wanted to acquire and practicing one a week all through the year and rotating through this list to try to become a better man and marking when he when he acted unvirtuously in one of these ways and just all in in a in a practice to try to be the best man that he could be which is so incredibly admirable to me and it's fascinating to me that the way forward in this practice he practiced these virtues on his own he talked to the men in his club for mutual improvement about them as well but self-education was a big part of, of that whole process. And I could pull for you a dozen books right now. I could walk over to my bookshelf and pull out, you know, book after book after book after book about the culture in early America, the culture until about 1900 in America, you know, starting in the 1600s, but especially really ramping up with the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers and the mentors that were here in America and the kind of education that the founding generation received in the 1700s. And this sincere love of truth. In fact, there's this letter that um, Thomas Jefferson wrote to Robert Skipwith. Robert Skipwith had said to him, you know, what do you think of, well, first of all, he said, you know, I need to be a lifelong learner and, you know, I've got a family and some kids and I've got this budding career that I'm pursuing, but I know that self-education is super important. So please send me a list of books that I could read in my leisure time. And he also asked Thomas Jefferson, and by the way, what do you think of this new form of writing called a novel? And Jefferson gave him a book list. It's the famous Jefferson book list that he sent to his brother-in-law Skip with. But he also said about novels, you know, I believe that anything is good which educates us in the virtues that makes us better people and develops our character. And so, you know, there's these John Quincy Adler's, like, like all these writings by all these individuals that, that we needed to promote an education for a citizenry that knew how to be free. That's why it was called liberal because it's a uh, liberal education because it's from liber, which means free. It's the education to be free. And it was self-education. It was lifelong learning. It was taking ownership of what you put in your brain and who you decide you're gonna spend time with and letting the greatest creations, the greatest books, the greatest music, the greatest artwork elevate you ongoing all your life and help you to become the best that you can be. And Benjamin Franklin wanted that. And he had his flaws and he had his foibles, but he was genuinely on a lifelong pursuit to become the best that he could be. And this book club, this club for mutual improvement was a huge part of that. And it's fascinating to me because <laughs> This little club for mutual improvement had huge reverberating impact. So first of all, these individuals started to improve themselves. They got thinking on important topics. They were interacting with the most brilliant minds that had ever lived. They were comparing that with scripture. They were trying to implement it in their lives in a way that would make them better people, the pursuit of truth and implementation of truth, which is what I'm all about. Um, and, and totally focused on giving people the skills and tools to follow this type of self-education, to really have an education, what I call an education for real life, the kind of education that you didn't get at school, but that you desperately need so that you can meet your potential. 
and he, a lot of really awesome things happened. They honed their thinking skills and their writing skills, which made them better leaders, better thinkers, deeper thinkers. It helped them intellectually, it helped them spiritually, and it built this close-knit group of friends that were supporting each other. There's these stories that he talks about where they were helping each other later on in business to um, improve and get into public office and leadership positions, all kinds of things to have positive impact in the community. Well, what happened then was that people could see what kind of men they were becoming and what kind of an impact this was having on them. And so other people came to them and they were like, hey, can we join your club? This is super cool. And they, they knew that it, a tight knit group was going to be the best. I mean, I've, I've been involved in a lot of book clubs. The best discussions happen in groups of people of, of about four or five to 12. Now, one-on-one, one to -on -one, one two, one and three, that, that, that can be phenomenal as well. But once you get over 10 or 12 people, there's start there, there's less and less time for everyone to say what they want to say. So in fact, it just reminds me, um, Jordan Peterson just did his Exodus series and he got brilliant minds, you know, I think it's like six, seven, eight people into a room and they just talked, they just read scripture and then they all interjected their thoughts. And it's fascinating to listen to. It's enriching for them, enriching for the listener. Really that kind of thing is just so phenomenal to do. So they, um, they tell these people, we can't let you in our club because there's not enough room, but you should do it yourself. And so they teach these people how to go form these clubs. And so then there's more and more clubs for mutual improvement in this community in Philadelphia. And the community starts to increase their desire for lifelong learning. And you know, these skills are just as old as Western culture, really, they go back to Greece and, and, and Rome. It's very, very simple what you do. You just pick up great stuff. You interact, you argue with the author, you ask great questions, you get into a group, you hash it out. Sometimes you have a mentor that you can ask questions. You write about it in a commonplace book and then you go try to live the truths that you found. It's a very simple process. It's not all that complicated, but it's incredible the good that it can do. So they're all, you know, this club, I should say, went on for 40 years. And so you can imagine the quality of relationships that they had, just the, the, the impact for good that it had in their lives individually. Now, not only did the community start to improve because these other clubs, more and more and more clubs grew in their community, but also the idea of the public library sprung out of it. So they had a few books, they were borrowing back and forth from each other. And then finally they were like, okay, well let's rent a room and pay a little bit of money and let's all bring all our books there and lock them up so they're safe. So we all have access to them whenever we want to read them. And then maybe we could each donate and build up this shared lot of books because we're all kind of broke and we'd all love more to read. And, and, and if we pool our money, we don't have to buy duplicates. We can have, you know, as many books as we want, you know, over time we can build up this library that we're sharing, but then they realized actually the public could use these as well. They could pay us a little bit of money to guarantee that they'll take good care of them. And we could use that money to buy more books. And so this public library system was born and there have been public libraries in America ever since. And that idea of self-education really grew from that. Now, they also worked together to found the first hospital, like to put a hospital in the area, to put a fire department in the area, and to put a post office in the area and other public projects from this one group of just a handful of people in a club for mutual improvement. And um, this is what, this is what Benjamin Franklin says about just the public library part that was an outgrowth of this club. The institution soon manifested its utility, was imitated by other towns and in other provinces. The libraries were augmented by donations. Reading became fashionable. And our people became better acquainted with books and in a few years were observed by strangers to be better instructed and more intelligent than people of the same rank generally are in other countries. So it elevated the whole city and all the towns and provinces around and bled into other communities. And, you know, one of the things when John Quincy Adams was writing to his son, <clears throat> one of my favorite things I could 
do a post for you on it and give you a link to it. It's phenomenal, <laughs> these letters he wrote to his son um, on, on the study of the Bible. One of the things he said was, you know, I know it's really fashionable and you and your friends are always bragging about how many books you've read, but readings should make you a better person. And, and so he's, you know, he's basically like, you shouldn't just be bragging about the volume of books. If they haven't developed your character, what was the point? It was a waste of time. So this self-education, this way of improving yourself is available to you right now. It is possible for you to pick up a classic, to engage with the author, to discuss it with other people, and to implement principles in your life right now. And I just can't tell you how, you know, we had so many women in, in the Mission Driven Mom program that I did. I taught other lifelong learning courses and Principles of Liberty courses, stuff that's in my library now. And I just can't tell you how many times people were like, I didn't even know that I had a mental need. I didn't even know that this was what was wrong in my life, that I was craving deep thinking and quality conversation and connection with other people and a way to distill truth and to be more discerning and to understand myself and others better and to navigate my life more successfully. And it's really this simple formula and it's transformational for you and for the people in your club and for the community at large. You just never know. I mean, there's women now that were part of my academy for the last five years who are going on to offer, you know, they're in public positions, they're, they're funding charities, they're founding orphanages, um, they're putting on women's retreats. I mean, there's just so much good that needs to be done in the world. And when you're on fire about becoming the best that you can be through this lifelong self-education, you don't have any idea what good can come from it. You just don't. And the kinds of, you know, the tools that you gain for quality communication, for expressing your ideas clearly and empathically for listening to other people. I'm going to do, I'm going to do a video for you in the next few weeks on eight reasons that you need to discuss books and because it, it's going to be, you just need to know that. But I, I want to just finish up with a couple books that I grabbed off my shelf. I love Louis L'Amour. And if you've not read Education of a Wandering Man, it's so worth reading. And I want to read a couple things that he said just to kind of back up what I've said, I guess. Um, he says, this is the story, this book, this is the story of an adventure in education pursued not under the best of conditions. The idea of education has been so tied to schools, universities, and professors that many assume there is no other way, but education is available to anyone within reach of a library, a post office, or even a newsstand. He's like, today you can buy the dialogues of Plato for less than you would spend on a fifth of whiskey or Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire for the price of a cheap shirt. And they're even cheaper now. I mean, you can get used books for under a dollar. You can have free shipping on Amazon. You can get all of, you know, everything that's over 100 years old in the public domain for free online. You can get them read to you on LibriVox like, or a library app. There is just no end to the way that you can consume information. And if you'll go to the best of the best, it will make you the best that you could be. He goes on to say, often I hear people say that they do not have time to read. That's absolute nonsense. In one year during which I kept that kind of record, I read 25 books while waiting for people in offices, applying for jobs, waiting to see a dentist, waiting in a restaurant for friends. Many such places I read on buses, trains, and planes. If anyone really wants to learn, one has to decide what is important. Spending an evening on the town, attending a ball game, or learning something that can be with with you your life long. So beautiful. No matter how much I admire our schools, I know that no university exists that can provide an education. What a university can provide is an outline to give a, the learner a direction and guidance. The, one, the rest one has to do for oneself. In fact, Mortimer Adler says that exact same thing in the, his article. He says, 
Since for anyone to become an educated person, it is necessary for his or her learning to continue throughout the lifetime that follows graduation from college or university, the most crucial contribution that these institutions can make is in the field of the arts, the liberal arts, which, is, which are the arts of learning, the arts which discipline our creative powers. If your education has given you a superficial introduction to the whole world of learning, if it has given you the skills you need to go on learning, skills that also help you use your mind creatively, and if it has inspired you with a zest to use those skills to the utmost of your ability then it is done for you as much as you have any right to expect and I'm gonna say I know plenty of people who got all the way through college <clears throat> maybe a bachelor's degree maybe a master's degree without the skills for lifelong learning without knowing how to discern truth for themselves or find principles or compare sources without knowing how to take that back to scripture and then find proper applications for themselves without skills of creativity without the knowledge the self-knowledge that they need to pursue career or, or, or money making or just leisure time to just use their leisure time in ways that are enriching to them and other people. They don't have those skills. And so that's, that's what, that's what I'm here to try to give. That is the passion. That is what I've spent my last 23 years trying to figure out and trying to, um, do and i've got to say it has revolutionized my life and the lives of all, of of so many thousands of people who are on this journey with me gaining these skills applying them he goes on to say that um, a good human life is one that is enriched by as much leisure time as one can cram into it and he doesn't mean pleasure time he means leisure time he means spending your spare time doing things that enrich you and the people around you putting your gifts to use for humanity because you know what they are and you know that what better what better thing could you use your life doing what better thing could you spend your life on this is, um, Louis L'Amour says this same thing. Um, I'll end with this. It's so beautiful. He says, We are finally all wanderers in search of knowledge. Most of us hold the dream of becoming something better. Something better than we are. Something larger, richer, in some way more important to the world and ourselves. Too often the way taken is the wrong way with too much emphasis on what we ha what we want to have rather than what we wish to become. So please start thinking about who you want to become. Think more about that and less about what you want to have and recognize that in order to become, in order to truly meet your potential, it's gonna require lifelong learning, discernment of truth and application of objective, natural laws and principles. And in order to do that, you need the skills. And that's why I do what I do. You can keep watching what's on this channel. If you wanna join us, we've got a book club. This month is The Conflict of Visions, which is a podcast I put out recently. I've got a reading and discussion guide on it that you can go grab and we'll have a great time discussing that book in the community. You can read it on your own. You can grab a friend. I keep posting book reviews. I'm gonna to try to give you all the best resources I possibly can. Use the five types of questions videos that I've, that I've posted. Use the other study skills videos that I've posted. And begin, you know, grab, grab your friend, grab a friend, grab a spouse, uh, grab someone in your life that wants to be on a journey, wants to be involved in a club for mutual improvement. I mean, that's all my MDM Academy was. That's all my master classes are. That's all my book club is. It's just a, a place for us to, um, to begin to meet our potential, to follow the example of men like Louis L'Amour, women like, you know, Claire Barton, Corey Ten Boom, these women that I just, oh, I just love and admire so much, who use their leisure time to better themselves through dedicated lifelong learning and the impact is felt around the world when individuals do that. You just don't know how much light it will bring into your life. My, one of my favorite quotes from Mortimer Adler was that all books we will become light in proportion as you find light in them. And so when you pick up a book that seems too hard, that seems over your head, remember like Mortimer Adler said, that if you don't read what's over your head, you condemn your head to its present low altitude. You want to elevate yourself. You want to be more than you are. You want to become someone better than, than you are to become more of who you could be. 
meet your potential by being a lifelong learner. Thanks for joining me. See you next time. Hey, are you ready to have the truth set you free? Head over to AudraRinlessBacher.com and get the Truth Seeker Starter Kit for free, where I walk you through the five steps for discovering and applying true principles to your life so you can experience their liberating power. See you there.